Well, hello everyone, my name's Andy Oakley, and today we're discussing New Zealand issues. I'm delighted to introduce a friend of mine of many years and fellow author with Tross Publishing, Dr. John Robinson. John is a former university lecturer and a research scientist and prolific author of books about the historical development of New Zealand. Early in his life at Avondale College, John earned a national scholarship and he went on to gain master's degrees in mathematics at physics at Auckland University. Obviously, John was a talented academic and so he was drawn to one of the world's top academic institutions, MIT. And I'm not talking about Massey in Auckland. John was accepted and completed a doctorate at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston. From there, he went on to research and teach at the Imperial College London, Bristol University and the University of Rhode Island. Now, I first met John in about 2013. As a young kid, having dropped out of one of uh, New Zealand's poorest academic institutes at the time was a bit of an unlikely matchup, I suppose. However, I had become interested in the Treaty of Waitangi and the legislation around it. And John was an expert, so I sought him out. Having grown up with Māori and Polynesian in Cannons Creek, I could see that while Māori and Polynesians were going backwards since the social highs of the 1950s, 60s and 70s, so were all the other families in places like Pairua. And the more separatist policies that successive governments introduced, the worse the poverty and social conditions were becoming for the very people that the government was supposed to be helping. So in my book, the government and Māori leaders were failing abysmally and they were not being held to account. This is largely because more and more they controlled the media and they had the power to silence anyone who tried to hold them to account. In today's presentation, John is going to discuss some of these issues, but mostly he's going to talk about his book, He Pua Pua, A Blueprint for Breaking Up New Zealand, how this idea came about and the dangers of it. So take it away, John. For a long time, I've been worried about the division by race of New Zealand with the reinvention of history and changes in law. I had worked for many years for Massey University and Te Puni Kōkori, that's the Ministry of Māori Development, gathering statistics when in 2000, in the year 2000, a report to the Crown Forestry Rental Trust was turned down because the facts were of population recovery when land was being sold. The suggestion, that is the fact, that land loss had not led to population decline and that European colonisation had actually been beneficial for Maori was not allowed. I had to rewrite the report and hide the conclusion before being paid. I saw where the extension extensive treaty industry was going, distorting information and pushing towards separation. My concerns deepened when I learned of the 2019 Hei Puapua report to government, which had been kept secret during the 2020 election, and I watched as many of its policy ideas were acted on in 2021. I've written of the report and the implications in a Tross publishing book, Hei Purpur, Blueprint for Breaking Up New Zealand, and I've seen how its policies are being put into action. Um, here it is, the book here, Hei Purpur. Um, the Hei Purpur report to government is an expression of the wishes of Maori groups. Its preparation has not involved the rest of us, although it's intended to direct our society, direct all of us. Hei Purpur is based on a report prepared, prepared for a Maori non-government organisation. Matike Mai, the independent working group on constitutional transformation, was first promoted at a meeting of the Iwi Chairs Forum in 2010 and involved years of discussion among Māori, including 252 hui, but not involving other New Zealanders. The Hei Pūapua Working Group followed Matiki Mai, and they say they do, 
and adopted a Tariti model based around spheres of authority, introducing changes which, in their words, will require constitutional transformation. The resulting hei pua pua vision of the future in 2040 is of a fully divided country by 2040. There's no suggestion of equality. Here's a graphic and comprehensive separation of New Zealand. There is a government for all the people, and that involves Maori as well. There's a separate government for Maori only, and then there's a joint body who bring together the ideas and the decisions of the two governments, with Maori having control in all three of the segments. That idea of separate governing bodies had been put forward in a 2000 Building the Constitution conference attended by many people, not based, not only Maori, it was all people, it, and it had been rejected. But the idea did not go away, it went underground, continuing as a name for Maori activists. Now it is back in public view. Now, much of that picture of a separate Maori system is in place right now. It's led by a number of powerful organisations. These include the Maori Council, set up in 1962, the 1987 Iwi Leaders Forum, and the 1989 Maori Congress. The last is Congress claims considerable separate powers such as an official international status. And along with these, there's the King Movement and the powerful Maori Caucus in the Labour Party. These are supported by a considerable bureaucracy in the separate Maori organisations and many government departments, together making up an existing parallel government. It's not something just for the future, it's being set up and a lot of the elements are in place now. The process of discussion, so-called, has included the organisation of many hui to build up a separate viewpoint among Maori away from the rest of us. And in that parallel system, there's no recognition of equality or democracy. I keep looking for those words, equality, democracy, they're missing. My alternative vision for 2040 is a very simple one. Just all of us, together, one people, one circle there. Speaking for myself, I believe that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, which is the first article of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Note that I'm speaking on a personal basis here, because this belief is not held by all New Zealanders. I'm opposed to racism, which is recognition of race and different treatment to people of different races. And I believe in equality, as did Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela, other or people who fought rather hard and prominently against racism across the world. If the treaty is held to promote separation, then it should not be honoured. It's as simple as that. The principle of equality and the associated equal democracy should be the first priority in our society. The writing of He Purpur has been a logical progression, building from the rewriting of history in the treaty and aided very much by interventions by United Nations agencies. This part of the story starts with the Foreshore and Seabed Act passed by the Labour government in 2004, which was criticised at the time by National as giving too many special rights to Maori. However, many Maori, many Maori representatives thought that this act discriminated against Maori who were claiming ownership of all the seas, that being based on a treaty version where Hobson's secretary, Freeman, had introduced the word fisheries 
additional to the original property. The word fisheries was simply not there in the original, in the true Treaty of Waitangi. New Zealand had signed up to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights and had agreed to visits from their special rapporteurs. Thus, Maori organisations were able to make a direct approach to the United Nations, and they did so. As a result, the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination decided that the Foreshore and Seabed Act had refused Maori property rights. They didn't know what on earth they were talking about, but they did that. And a special rapporteur came to New Zealand for 10 days in 2005. He met with Maori leaders and reported a bicultural country made up basically of two ethnic components. The Maori, who traced their ancestry to the original Polynesian inhabitants, and the descendants of the European colonists and settlers known as Pākehā. He was told that we we're not one people. There's no recognition there, none at all, of the many people who now make up the rich mix of New Zealanders. His lengthy list of recommendations to the government included that the Foreshore and Seabed Act should be repealed or amended, and that iwi and hapu should be considered as likely units for strengthening the customary self-government of Maori. This United Nations group claimed the authority to direct New Zealand law, contrary to the UN Charter, which promises no interference in the international, sorry there, no interference in the internal affairs of member countries. The UN further developed the idea of separate peoples in 2007 with a Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The introduction to the Declaration includes a powerful rebuttal of inheritance of, I'm sorry, the introduction to the Declaration includes a powerful rebuttal of inherent differences between people, is the quote that all doctrines, policies and practices based on or advocating superiority of peoples or individuals on the basis of nat national origin or racial, religious, ethnic or cultural differences are racist, scientifically false, legally invalid, morally condemnable and socially unjust to which I say, good on you, that is a really excellent statement. But the document is a mass of contradictions and it calls for special rights for indigenous people that's based on ethnicity. It sees no difference in national histories. There's complete ignorance in all of this. They say that indigenous peoples have suffered from historic injustices as a result of, inter alia, their colonisation and dispossession of their lands, territories and resources. Uh, just who is Indigenous and why? And what are their lands, territories and resources is not defined and we're not knowing what are our lands, territories and resources because uh, they all apparently are belonging to this indigenous group. Now the Helen Clark government read that and refused to sign. But the following John Key government broke with national party policy by rewriting the foreshore and seabed legislation in favour of Maori into quite an extreme form. And in 2010, Peter Sharples went secretly to New York to sign the declaration. Then a second United Nations Special Rapporteur, invited this time by the government, came for six days. And then there was a third United Nations visit in 2019 in response to a request from the Aotearoa Independent Monitoring Mechanism, note the change of the name of our country, which was monitoring the application of this UN declaration on behalf of 
the National EWI Chairs Forum and the New Zealand Human Rights Commission. During all three United Nations visits, UN visitors met with Maori organisations and not with the general population. All believed that Maori should have separate status and all arrogantly set down proposals directing major changes in New Zealand legislation. Wherever they went, the UN rapporteurs were told stories of wrongs done to Maori and they believed it all because they believed that colonisation had harmed Indigenous people everywhere and all, at all times. So never questioning, never professional, never checked information fed to them. For example, the visitors were told that serious harm done by Maori by colonisation is shown by the significant decline of the Maori population in the 19th century following colonisation. That one fact I mean, is a true is a true fact, but that one fact is never put into context. Here's a graph of the Maori population throughout the 19th century based on known facts. You'll see the rapid decline during the Maori Wars when there was a killing and social breakdowns with female infanticide, which was frequently reported resulting in shortages of girls and women shown clearly in the statistics and then recovery over the 50 years after the treaty brought peace and settled family life. The minimum was about um, 18, 1890 and after that uh, there was a growth in the population of Maori. Another example of the acceptance of one isolated fact without considering the context is the difference of life expectancy. In 2005, the UN rapporteur claimed harm from colonisation, since at that time, Maori life expectancy was significantly lower than that of non-Maori, and he said by almost 10 years. This point was repeated in 2021 by the Health and Dis Disability Review Transition Unit with a claim that the health system is failing. Our health and disability system has underperformed for Maori for too long. Life expectancy is seven years less than for Pākehā. There's no context, no knowledge of changes over time which is shown in the differences between the two claims, 10 years at one point and seven the other. Let's look at the changes since 1925. That's the um, time spout range where we have those statistics. Now, while Maori life expectancy had improved considerably, having doubled from 20 to 25 years in 1840 to almost 50 years in 1940. There was still a large difference of around 20 years in 1940 between Maori and non-Maori life expectancy when Maori started to move into the cities in large numbers. Now understand that this graph is of the difference of life expectancy between Maori and non-Maori and the two curves given for the males and for the females. Now, however, after um, 1840 or so, they gained better access to the health system, having moved into the cities and better conditions of living. And the gap steadily reduced to about five years in 1984. Had that trend continued, and I put in that red line to just follow a general trend through that period, the gap in life expectancy could have been, it could have disappeared around 2000 or just after. By now, it would have been a thing of the past. That's just a simple projection, but that's the way things were going. But the trend reversed sharply after 1984 as globalization and rogernomics, with its great increase in unemployment and inequality, 
hit the largely working class Maori society. The gap increased to nine years before settling to around seven years. And that change in trend is very clear. That was a consequence of modern political decisions that had, had nothing to do with long ago colonization. This is a foolish country. Major decisions are based on incomplete and false information driven by a political agenda. The treaty is considered the basic document, yet is poorly understood, and discussion of the treaty is blocked. The fisheries, the foreshore and seabed now do not belong to all of us, and that is based on a version of the treaty cobbled together after the first signing. Even science is now directed by tribal superstition, Mataranga Maori, with appointed gatekeepers. This is a power grab taking power from the gullible to the chosen few. Now, the process has not been open to the public. Hei Pua Pua was handed to the government in 2019, but hidden from the 2020 election and only became known in 2021 after questions in the House from opposition MPs. There's a blanket refusal to tell the public of the issues. While there is talk of involving us all in an open debate, the reality is the very opposite. There may be an occasional mention of, pop, of possible discussion, but nobody in authority ever uses their position to organise any public debate, and they have been challenged to do so, and they have not done so. But while the report has been put on a shelf, supposedly away from the public gaze, many of its proposals have been put into action. Hei Pūpū called for the establishment of Maori seats and local government bodies by central government. This was done, it's been done, when the rights of ratepayers to call for a binding refer referendum when Maori wards are proposed was revoked. Hei Pua Pua called for independent indigenous education systems and healthcare systems. Now, New Zealand has a dual education system with two different curriculums. There's a New Zealand curriculum, which is taught in English medium schools, and a separate, a separate curriculum for Maori medium schools, which describes the essential knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes appropriate to Maori medium schools. The attitudes taught, taught in Maori schools call on students to be proud to be Maori, but there's no thought that any pupils should be proud to be New Zealanders. This is brainwashing. The curriculums have been rewritten based on a grievance-driven presentation of history, leaving out the contributions of non-Maori to the building of the nation. So uh, the story of New Zealand that is to be taught is more and more biased and inaccurate. The desired split is found also in the health system. An interim Maori health authority has been established as a departmental agency within the Ministry of Health and legislation making it permanent entity comes into effect in July 2022. The rewrite, again, the rewriting of law by judges has continued with fundamental changes in legal understanding of the Treaty of Waitangi and even the introduction of an unexplained version of traditional Maori culture to Kanga as a basis for legal decisions. I should remind you all that the basic Tikanga back before uh, 1840 involved warfare between the tribes, cannibalism, all sorts of horrors. Um, and we must understand what is meant by Tikanga if it's to be written into our law as it is. Our land and our water no longer belong to us all. The Three Waters Plan proposes to take the infrastructure and control of water systems, this is the three waters of drinking water, wastewater and stormwater, into central government control. 
with a whole system that is guided and regulated by Maori. After more than 60 iwi-only meetings, let me repeat that, after more than 60 iwi-only meetings, the government and tribal leaders have divided New Zealand into four zones. Control in each zone will be by an agency managed 50-50 by tribal and council appointees on a 12-member board. At the moment, it is governed by councils, which are elected by all of us, but that will go. Even the regulator will be Maori, a new crown entity, Taumata Arawai, will operate from a Te Ao Māori perspective. This separation into two peoples begs the question of just who are Māori? The definition in legislation is that a Māori is a member of the Māori race. This is meaningless. A Māori is a Māori, doesn't tell you a thing. While placing the concept of a separate race directly, explicitly in New Zealand law. In practice, there are many Maori measures of Maori. The census has sole Maori, ethnic Maori, and iwi identification, and these categories vary over time, the definitions and the way people answer them. Other measures include that in the Household Labour Force Survey, and measurements by various authorities such as nurses, police, teachers, and the estimates vary considerably. Um, most importantly, in the 2018 census, 625,000 people ticked the Maori box for themselves and their children. After con but after considerably, con start again. Estimates vary considerably. In the 2018 census, 625,000 people tip the Maori box for themselves and their children. After considerable juggling, a Maori descent, usually resident population count of 900,000 was used to calculate the Maori electoral population. That's more than 40% greater by playing with numbers somehow. So there are now seven Maori seats instead of the five, which would be allotted on population numbers. The others of us, the non-Maori, are a mixed group with people from all over the world, from many cultures, but we're set apart from the minority Maori who themselves share very much of that mixed ancestry. Most of today's Maori are in these race terms of mixed ethnicity. The division into two people, the emphasis on supposed wrongs of colonisation, and calls for restitution through the treaty settlements process and the rulings of the Waitangi Tribunal are held to be based on the Treaty of Waitangi. We should all then be aware of the full story of the preparation and the meaning of the treaty. So I just present a few facts there. There's a lot more to be known if you want to understand just what this treaty is. So how was the treaty written? A number of suggestions and drafts were set down over several days of discussions in February of 1840. Then a final copy was decided upon on February the 4th and translated into Maori to be presented to the chiefs on February 5th. And you'll note that the chiefs were so pleased to be offered this treaty that they had just one afternoon of discussion and then came the following morning demanding to be able to sign the treaty and head off home. This is quite unusual in the story of Maori discussions. For example, when a king was proposed in the Waikato, um, on two occasions, there were several days of hui, of discussion, of to and fro, then no agreement whatsoever was reached. But with the treaty, this is what the Maori chiefs wanted. 
The final copy in England, English was written by James Busby in its dated February the 4th and it was mislaid until it was discovered in 1989 as, and is known as the Littlewood Treaty. That is the same, the same as a copy in English that was sent by James Reddy Clinton to the United States immediately following the first signing. And it's the same of tr many translations before 1975, including a 1922 translation by Aparana Nata. There is in fact just one treaty, both Maori and English copies are very much the same, just the same. Unfortunately, in the few days after the signing of the treaty began, Clendon, this is Hob, uh, left the original English text with his lawyer, Littlewood, therefore the name Littlewood Treaty when it was discovered in the desk. And Hobson's secretary, James Friedman, decided to produce a new version, making use of the earlier drafts, which he sent to Australia on February the 8th. This has since sat in the archives and has become accepted as the English treaty. But it's still quite incredible. This cobbled together and inaccurate version of the treaty has been accepted from then to the present day. And official accounts that you'll find online today are that there are two very different treaties of Waitangi, which is complete nonsense. The interpretation and meaning of the treaty actually gathered importance in 1975 when the Waitangi Tribunal was set up. A new translation by Hugh Kafaru changed the meaning of Tanga from property to treasures that year, thus allowing a considerable extension of possible claims. It was clearly property, but treasures, well, you can claim anything under the word treasures. In 1986, Hippie to Hugh Hugh got Geoffrey Palmer to insert into the State-Owned Enterprises Act Nothing in this act shall permit the Crown to act in a manner that is inconsistent with the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. Thus the idea of principles of the treaty was born, just invented. Then in 1987, the five justices of the Supreme Court decided that the treaty established a relationship akin to a partnership. So the, the word partnership started to enter the language. The law has further changed since then to include an acceptance of te kanga, the pre-treaty Maori culture, and none of these changes has been fully explained nor investigated. Neither principles nor partnership in the Treaty of Waitangi and neither is defined. The treaty has then been reinterpreted by politicians and judges and then used to justify considerable changes to the unwritten Constitution of New Zealand. All of this, including the reversal of the meaning of, of the Treaty of Waitangi and the rewriting of history, insists that we must be considered and treated as two separate people with different rights. Now, many of the stories being told about Waitangi are ridiculous. There's a lot of nonsense being told. It's well worth checking checking when you're told things. One concerns Hobson's words to each chief when he said, in Maori, we are now one people. A modern version is that Hobson meant, we are brethren and countrymen, two people, not one. So the whole saying is turned on its head. Now, I did check it. That strange story is actually based on a report by Felton Matthew who only spoke English and did not understand the Maori phrase. Questioning an open debate of what is going on is, however, closed down by government control of a compliant media. Government has provided a much needed subsidy of $105 million to the media with strings attached. They're worth knowing about those strings. 
there must be a commitment to Te Tiriti o Waitangi and to Māori as a Te Tiriti partner with coverage including content that meets the definition of Māori and iwi journalism. And there's something different than other journalism, is this Māori and iwi journalism, with focus areas such as Te Reo Māori and Te Kanga, and political matters. Political matters have to be considered in journalism instead of reporting the facts. This implies an acceptance of the new interpretation of the treaty, together with politically correct references to Tukanga. Those speaking out for equality and democracy have no place here. This talk, for example, does not satisfy those criteria, and much of what I've said is not permitted in the media. Sounds extreme. But that extreme sounding comment is justified by a recent crude attack on me and a small publisher, Tross Publishing, in two evening broadcasts of TV1 News. Won't go into that lot of rubbish in detail here. The reporter charged us with hate speech and called for a ban on our bilks. That was nonsense. It was a blatant attempt to shut us up. The immediate response was a boom in sales of the books, by the way. If they had had their way, a talk such as this that I'm giving here would be banned. Now, I simply think for myself, research the facts and report what I find. That's all I do. All my books are well referenced and many of the key sources I identify are well worth reading by anyone interested in the story of New Zealand and they're available through Trost Publishing.